Hello, my name is Alex Dean. I'm a professor at North Carolina State University. I want to tell you about the new course that we've developed called the Connected MCU Lab. This is a work that's collaboration between Microchip, Imagination Technologies, and Digilent. This course is designed to be an introduction very early in the curriculum to embedded systems and Internet of Things concepts. So this course is targeted for in the first year. So the students just need to have some C programming experience. We'll see how we make this work. So we start off looking at embedded systems, which have computers embedded in them to monitor and control them. We look at reasons for why we might embed a computer. Flashlights, cars, airplanes, all have or may have computers in them in order to improve the performance somehow, to give better features. We look at how to embed a computer. So we're not talking about taking a laptop computer and adding it to a flashlight. We're talking about adding a very small chip, which is still a computer, and using that to monitor and control the device. We look at the differences between these kinds of computers. We look at the peripherals that we get with these embedded computers, which make a really big difference in how much work these can do. And we look at multi-threaded software, which gives us the illusion of concurrency. And we look at the differences from general purpose computers. In this course, we also look at the Internet of Things. For example, a thermostat that controls your heat pump or air conditioner. If we connect that through the Internet to other devices, we can get some nice benefits. Maybe we have a smartphone app that we can use to monitor and control the system. Uh, maybe the power con company can control the thermostat if too much power is being drawn from the grid. There are quite a few benefits for connecting embedded systems to the Internet. And this is what we have with the Internet of Things. The target platform we're using for this class starts with a processor core from Imagination Technologies. So this is a MIPS32 CPU core. This is a very fast CPU running at up to 200 million instructions per second and it has support for hardware floating point and quite a few other high performance features. That CPU core is contained within a PIC32 microcontroller from Microchip. So this is the PIC32MZ series of microcontrollers which have the MIPS32 core and then peripherals for interfacing with the external world and also for offloading work from the processor and on-chip memory as well. Finally, this microcontroller is contained within the Digilent Chipkit Wi-Fi or development board. This board contains the microcontroller and peripherals. It has a Wi-Fi communication module so it can communicate wirelessly. It has lights, it has control knobs, it has switches, it has uh, USB interfaces, it has headers for expansion, and it has power supply hardware. So these are the three components that we use in this system. In this course, students start off by learning the microcontroller fundamentals. So microcontroller programming and interfacing. They learn microcontroller concepts, such as what the CPU is, what it does, what the memory is, how it works, what peripherals are, how they can be used, how we combine all three of these to create a system that can execute multiple sections of a program concurrently. So we have software as well as hardware executing simultaneously. We look at software development. We see the differences between source code and object code and understand the differences why. We look at the software tool chain and the build process and we also work with debugging tools and learn debugging processes. This course gives hands-on experience with the most important peripherals and it covers the others with a higher level survey. We focus on the general purpose digital I.O., the inputs and outputs, analog to digital and digital to analog converters, timers, using them as interval timers, counters, using them to generate pulse width modulated signals or capturing the timing of input events. We look at communications, asynchronous serial communication, UART communication, uh, SPI, I squared C. We also look at Wi-Fi, USB and Ethernet at a higher level. 
We also look at peripherals for robustness, such as the watchdog timer and the low voltage detector. And there are other peripherals as well that we don't get into detail on the clock generators, DMA controllers, and accelerators. We also look at how to interface the board with Arduino shields. One of the fundamental concepts of embedded systems is that of concurrency. So we expect one microcontroller to be able to manage multiple activities seemingly at the same time. But we only have one processor core running, typically. Even if we have more than one processor core, we have many more software threads than we have hardware processor cores. So we need to share the processor core somehow among these different threads. So we use concurrency. And we provide the concurrency using some type of scheduling approach. This course talks quite a bit about different scheduling approaches because that's so fundamental for developing embedded systems efficiently. Here we have an example of a sequence diagram. We have multiple actors. These could be hardware or software. And time progresses vertically. In this case, we can see there's a timer module that is generating an overflow signal that is triggering another peripheral, a direct memory access controller, to copy some data to a digital to analog converter output. So this operation is playing back an audio waveform that's stored in memory and sending it out a digital to analog converter. Here we have an interrupt request which triggers an uh, interrupt service routine that handles the DMA controller and is going to send a signal to a software task to refill the buffer with the new data. So this is an example of the kind of concurrency that we have in embedded systems, where we have multiple software threads as well as hardware peripherals that are acting independently but with synchronization. So this is a fundamental concept for the students to understand. The embedded system is more than just what your source code says. It's more than just the program that's running. There are multiple pieces within that program. So in this course, we look at various ways of supporting concurrency. We look at schedulers and task prioritization and preemption for those tasks. We look at interrupts using finite state machines. And we end up using a preemptive kernel. We also look at creating multitasking systems. We look at synchronization between the tasks and communication. And we also introduce basic real-time system concepts, such as schedulability and response time. This is operating systems for embedded systems. But this is very different from what you would get in a typical computer science class, because that's a different domain from what we need for these embedded systems. The course also contains a focus on creating Internet of Things devices. So in this course module, we learn about how to create an Internet of Things device using the Imagination Technologies Creator IoT framework. And we learn about the protocols, the devices, objects, and resources that are represented within that framework and application design. This lab uses the WiFi's Wi-Fi module, which allows it to communicate to a wireless access point and communicate to the internet. And there, you can use an Android smartphone app to communicate and control this device. And switch on LEDs, switch them off, read the status of the switches on the board, read the CPU temperature, uh, potentiometer value. So we step through um, how to add functionality to an existing application. In this part of the course, we look under the CPU's hood. Initially, when we introduced the CPU, we present it as something that executes the program. But to understand it properly, we need to go and see the details inside. The instructions that the CPU executes are not C language instructions. They're machine code instructions from the MIPS 32 instruction set architecture. So we examine those. We examine what happens when the processor responds to interrupts and exceptions. So there isn't an instantaneous response. There are several steps that need to take place. We also introduce some advanced concepts, which provide sort of a hook for the really 
bright students in the class that are curious about some things and they like to know how it works. So microarchitecture is a hot topic. How does the processor execute those instructions so quickly? So we show instruction pipelining, branch prediction, out of order execution, all of which are used in order to speed up the CPU to enable it to run at 200 megahertz. We also look at memory systems. Um, there's RAM and flash ROM in the chip also, but that memory is much slower than the CPU core. So we need support systems, such as caches, a prefetch module, and an interconnection network that allow the memory to appear to be as fast as the CPU. So these components deliver the data that the CPU is probably going to need ahead of time, so the CPU doesn't need to wait. These topics tie in with the traditional computer organization class, and that's one of the strengths of this course because you can tie in with the Harris and Harris textbook and other material from Imagination Technologies for teaching computer organization. Another topic that we cover in this course has a hook to get the really bright students excited and motivated is to discuss performance analysis. How do we make the program go faster? And it's a fascinating topic. We tell the processor what we want it to do, but we're actually not using the processor's native language. We're using C code or some other source code. That code then gets compiled or translated to the machine code. Is the translation a good one or not? Well, maybe the compiler is doing a pretty bad job. Maybe it's got a lot of other things that it's doing that we don't know about. Part of doing performance analysis is understanding what the compiler is actually telling the processor to do. So looking at how the source code and the object code correlate. So we're, we want to be able to see, for this source code, there seems to be a lot of extra work going on in the object code. Let's see if we can change things and tune our control flow or tune our tool chain better. In order to find out what the CPU is spending its time on, we use profiling. So in this course module, we include a profiling module that periodically interrupts the processor and tracks what code was executing. And by doing this, it can tell you this part of the program dominates the execution time. And that's the part where you should start looking. The big problem with optimizing code generally is wasting time optimizing things that don't really matter. So using profiling tells you which parts matter. And then once we know the parts that are the slowest, we can see how to speed them up. We can examine the object code to make sure the compiler did a good job, maybe help the compiler do a good enough job. We can modify the source code, and we can modify the algorithms in order to make the code go faster. This course has quite a few hands-on activities. It's structured as a one semester course early in the curriculum. So rather than having many open-ended projects in which students can get lost, I'm focusing on having demonstrations that the students can step through as well as directed lab exercises with specific instructions so that we have a higher probability of success for each student. So there's a lot of hands-on work in here. So distributed across the course, we have quite a few uh, demonstration programs, as well as the lab exercises or programming. These are all fun. I encourage you to take a look at these modules. How can you get access to these teaching materials? Well, first join the Imagination University program. So the imgtech.com slash university, click on join IUP. There's an email verification stage, so you'll be sent an email, which you'll have to click on. Then you can visit the Imagination community. Here, you log in, and you can request the download for the materials and accept the license. So the license for this material is quite flexible. If you're using it for academic purposes, it's unrestricted. You can do anything you want with it. Uh, you will need to provide details of your intended use. And then you'll receive a request-approved email with a download confirmation. We already have this course being taught at at least two universities, and we look forward to hearing from you.